Ishvaro Gurat Meti Muji Veda Vibagine Vyo Mavda Vyapta Dehaya Dakshina Murtaye Namaha Sava Vedanta Sedanta Gaucharam Tamagocharam Govindam Paramanantam Sati Guru Pranatosh Maham Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti Om. Namaste. Welcome to our Panchadas, beginning chapter four, the discrimination of duality. Now the discussion on the worlds of duality created by Ishvara and Jiva and shoes. What is the meaning of this word and shoes? I, I forgot to look into the dictionary. Both. Means it begins. Begins? Okay. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> While it created by Ishvara and Jiva begins. Its purpose is to clarify the ways duality causes bondage for Jiva. Okay, so our goal here is the jiva and the jiva and the jiva. I mean, to say the way Shwara creates duality is not relevant to us. It's our relationship towards duality, which is relevant to the jiva because it causes bondage. No? If, uh, if we believe in duality as the ultimate reality. And then we are caught up uh, with attachment, uh, with objects of experience, and then we experience samsara. Yeah? So duality cannot be reversed. Duality can be neutralized, but uh, only in the sense that the jiva does not believe in the absolute reality of this projection and much less that the objects can indeed deliver that happiness, that permanent peace and happiness, which is the goal of all jivas, of all human beings. Huh? So it's a question of maturity to understand that the world will never solve this human problem. Huh? Only, only self-knowledge will do. So very rare individuals come to that conclusion. Huh? To that understanding. <clears throat> Once the difference between Ishwara's duality and Jiva's duality is appreciated, the duality of the Jiva can be negated. The negation of Jiva's duality is, is synonymous, is equal to liberation. Yeah? So here, right away, we are talking about two levels of duality, Ishwara's duality and Jiva's duality. Yeah? So Ishwara's duality is the creator and the creation, Ishwara and Jagata. Né? And then the Jiva, Jiva's duality is Jiva, Jagata, né? Jiva, and the, the experience entity and its environment. That's the duality, the, the, the subject, Jiva, né? and the object, the world. Ishwara's duality is the creator and creation. The Jiva appears with seeing the creation and shines with consciousness. And then it sees the wallet from that standpoint. It does not see the wallet, see the world from the standpoint of Ishwara. It does not see the world from the standpoint of Brahman unless it has a hard and fast self-knowledge, but sees the world from the point of vista of the reflector, the reflector, the, the, the shining entity, the one who reflects consciousness with the thought feeling, I am, I exist. And the world exists before my eyes, before my, my mind. You know? So those are the two dualities. And the whole deal here is to negate Jiva's duality. And we know that Jiva's duality can be negated in terms of 
reali reality that we attribute to this projection, to this superimposition. And uh, the literal negation of this projection it's in, is impossible because it's within the power of Maya, as we know. <clears throat> so the following verse 12, 2 to 13 will explain creation from various uh, Upanishadic theories. It is necessary to reference them because Ishwara is beyond perception and inference. So how are we going to explain uh, creation? Uh, if, uh, if creation is something that implies a creator, uh, and, uh, and Ishwara, the creator, is beyond the, the human intellect understanding. Uh, and then we need to rely on what? We have to rely on the Upanishads, the revealed knowledge. When we have no means to understand things uh, via perception and inference, and then we have to go to the scriptures. You know, Once we see the power, we see the, the beauty, the, the, the clarity and the undoubtful logic presented by the scripture, we develop shraddha. And then we say, okay, this is the means of knowledge to understand the Shwara, because if I, I'm left to myself, the concept of God is something so abstract that I have no means to wrap my mind around it. Okay, I have the help of the scriptures and then I contemplate and then I say, wow, it does make so much sense. This creator, this, this self-conscious being, you know, which is made of pure sativa, pure knowledge, extremely subtle uh, and just managing this universe, sustain, projecting uh, and sustaining and, and protecting and recycling. So the, the intelligence is something so uh, easily understood once we, we look at the world in the light of the teachings of the Upanishads. And then we see, we know Ishwara, but not through perception and inference, but through the teachings of the Upanishads and quite some refinement, intellectual refinement that allows the individual to contemplate on these teachings until we see according to the vision of Vedanta. You know? It is a vision that develops gradually. And then we know, but we, we did not rely on our perception and influence. You know? We had to have a, a help from the scripture. In the second and the third Brahma Sutras, Badarayana logically proves that Ishwara cannot be logically understood or proved because it is beyond the human logic, Apurushaya. Because of this fact, there is no reason for the creation. So we cannot understand Ishwara there are some pointers about the, about, about the way Ishwara sustains by certain laws, but the scriptures never says why Ishwara or even Brahman brought about this projection, this, this creation. It never speculates on, on, in that area, you understand? The scriptures. But uh, it, it's going to talk a little bit about the way this universe is sustained by the Lord and in which way the, the, the essential nature of Jiva and Ishwara is one and the same as pure conscious existence. Huh? So it can never be proved by the mind logically, intellectually. It's beyond the human comprehension. Because of this fact, there is no reason for creation. It, we say that it simply is, ah, but everybody wants to know why. You know, when you come to, to contact with the Vedanta people, especially at the beginning, they always have this question. A lot of the time they are ashamed to ask you, but why? Why this projection? Why this samsara? Why this situation? You know? Why, why, why this, this meteor came into place? What for? What is the purpose? Huh? We don't know what's the purpose. And here there is a beautiful insight. I love this insight. The only explanation, I mean, it simply is, exists. The only reasonable explanation of the why of the creation 
from the jiva's point of view, of course, because it's the jiva is the one who wants to resolve this doubt, this question, and this curiosity, you know? It says, oh, why is creation? Just to create an irritant that's gonna cause the jiva atma to seek freedom from this projection, or from the belief that everything here is real, you know? Because uh, once we, we are caught in here, and then immediately we are subject to this incredible power of a video, which blinds us and makes us just going extrovert, trying to, to find satisfaction by consuming yeah, objects. And then uh, we get so irritated, so frustrated, you know, that we want to some, somehow find a solution for this condition. And uh, with maturity, we will, we will understand that it's not by consuming more and more and more objects of desires. Creation. Creation takes place in two stages. The first stage involves only Ishwara. Ishwara is a mixture of consciousness and Maya. So this is a very nice... Yeah? It is a mixture of consciousness, and then there is a certain power that somehow is associated to consciousness, but it's not part of consciousness. You know? But this power, every time this power awakens, let's say, or, or begins operating, and then we have we have this situation. You know, we have Ishwara as a mixture of consciousness in association with Prakriti or Maya, the most fundamental nature of media. Huh? So, and then we have matter, and then we have the spirit of Brahman, and then uh, we bring in, into it, you know, this Lord of this universe as a mixture, you know, Maya and consciousness. In the presence of the light of consciousness, Maya also creates infinite gross and subtle bodies, okay? So it brings about Ishwara, or oh, Ishwara is not really a creation of Maya, but it's a, an avoidable outcome. Every time Maya appears, it brings about Ishwara because Maya exists due to the blessings or the, the or the how you say the the power, which is not a power. Right? I, escaping me the word. But uh, it's due to consciousness, Brahman, you know? And then due to Brahman, Maya exists. And then once this mixture of consciousness and Maya, you know, comes into play, and then we have Ishwara unavoidably, okay? And then Ishwara or Maya, you know, is going to, by the power, by, by the grace, grace is the word I was looking for, by the grace of consciousness, Ishwara is going to create infinite gross and subtle bodies. And here it says Maya, okay? So Maya is the most fundamental power, Prakriti, and then it brings about Ishwara once, once this mixture of Maya, Maya consciousness comes and then pure sattva comes, which is Ishwara, and then Ishwara begins playing with the three energies and then the subtle elements and start creating everything in the macrocosm causal body. Huh? So Maya creates, Ishwara creates infinite growth and subtle bodies, you know, the physical material world, but everything in the creation begins in the subtle body. Huh? In, in, the, in the causal body, in the macrocosm causal body, everything starts coming into existence there. And then it gratifies to produce the subtle and the physical world. The gross bodies are visible matter and the subtle bodies are invisible matter. A jiva is a subtle body shining with consciousness. So a jiva, what is a jiva? Well, jiva is a reflection of consciousness on the human subtle body. Although we call, we call a fly or insect or, or a cockroach, we call a jiva. But in general, when we talk in terms of jiva atima, we refer to 
to the human jiva, and not only when we say jiva is the is in the awakening state, the the vishwa, okay? Because the, the the deep sleeper and the dreamer, they they usually we refer, we don't refer as the jiva. The jiva is mostly the one, the human jiva, in the awakening state, <clears throat> because it's there that the jiva can process vasanas, process its karma and go about you know, its journey, the journey of the soul. A jiva is, the, is, is consciousness shining in the subtle body, and it shines by the grace of consciousness. It's called chidabasa, very simple and clear, reflected consciousness. Okay, a jiva is not the subtle body. We need to get this picture clear because otherwise there will be confusion. The jiva is the chidabasa, okay? and uh, abasa and chida, so it's reflected consciousness. When the jiva appear, when jivas appear, the second stage begins, which is jiva duality, yeah? because from the standpoint of the jiva, although the jiva does not find himself, oh, I'm the creator of my universe, no, he knows, oh my God, I find myself here in this world, and I'm already old enough to have a sense of identity, yeah, I'm already 12, 15, 18, 20. Oh my God, now I understand I'm here and I have a lot of things that I need to do here to go about. And uh, so in that moment that is this wallet, the, the jiva, which is reflected consciousness, but it's not the pure reflection of, cons of, of consciousness such as pure sattva or pure, pure knowledge or vishwara, but now it's a, a lousy or, or or more poor, poorer reflection of consciousness in the subtle body, which is conditioned by rajas and tamas, and not only sattva guna. So now we have this reflection, the jiva does not really know what's going on, he sees the world, and this is the duality from the perspective of the jita, jiva atma. <clears throat> so far so good? Today I don't have cloud to ask him to explain. You too, I know that you can explain very well. <laughs> There's no point to us. <coughs> okay, do. Two to nine. The Upanishads say that before creation, there was awareness of consciousness alone. And it said, let me create the worlds. Then desire to be many, it created the worlds by its will, lending existence and consciousness to them. So it lends existence to the inert physical material world, and then it lends consciousness, you know, in the sense of sentience, to the jivas, yeah? to the sentient beings. Yeah? We, we, we understand the concept of sentient beings, yeah? jivas in general, is any creature that uh, is perceiving its environment and re responding to the in inputs, you know, to the stimulus of its environment. So ants, ants are jivas. I feel sorry for them, but they, they eat my, my little plants when they start growing. And uh, it's a constant battle here because it's a wild place and they have this, the universe on the ground, you know, and uh, we have to put poison to, to contain them otherwise, you know, and I have to, oh my God, I have to kill all these jivas, you know, it's not easy. <laughs> How you deal with that, Mark? You, you leave it to nature? Huh? Your mic is closed. I say it's a balance. So what I do is I, I plant more and allow for a certain amount of losses. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. We've got a problem with with we got a problem with deer at the moment because it's so hot and dry here. The deer are getting into the vegetable garden and eating all the vegetables. So mm -hmm. we have our problems also. Yeah. Yeah. I have problems with ants, with birds. No, 
and some other creatures as well. But ants seems to be the, I mean, birds are very difficult, but now I relaxed. I, I, I'm doing just as you say, uh, we have to allow some loss knowing that, uh, I don't know, sometimes they get tired of eating one thing and then they, they leave the rest for us. But uh, it is a constant thing, you know, everybody wants to have a share. Huh? I'm reminded of that saying by William Blake, the cut worm forgives the plow. Say it again, please. The cut worm forgives huh? the plow. Or gives the plow. Uh, yeah. can, can you translate, please? Uh, in other words, that innocent life um, is gone through innocence. I mean, the whole the whole field is innocent in a sense. Yeah. It's yeah. all. It forgives. It forgives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, just walking around, I killed so many ants, some so many insects. You know. I mean, it's. But once we think about that, we don't want to even step outside, you know, say, oh, let me be careful here. No, I mean, I have problems with, with spiders because the spiders, I find it so beautiful. And Sylvia, she has trauma. And then I, I, I have to somehow take it out if I can, you know? And, uh, and then I also, I feel sorry for the snakes because snakes have a terrible reputation. And the, the natives here they kill the snakes because they are very poisonous. And uh, and the, the cases here are common that people you know step and then they get bit, you know, bite, bit, and then uh, and then they have to rush to the hospital, which is far from here. So they kill. But uh, I always try to tell, tell them, don't, don't leave them around, leave them around, leave them around. And they find me a little bit crazy, but the snakes, it's really, I mean, I have something with the snakes. I, I, I find it's very unfortunate to kill them. You have snakes as well, Mark? Yeah, we have snakes as well. I actually took one out of our bedroom last season. It has oh. come in and crawled into our bedroom. So, yeah, we have vipers, mainly vipers, mm -hmm. and they are toxic. Um, I'm not sure how long it would take to kill it, me if it bit me, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a I lot of... I have some experience around. with living around Osho Rajanish in Pune, of having a huge one enter through the bathroom in, uh, in my bedroom, and I was with two children, my son and his friend, reading to them... Uh, uh, Obelix and Asterix and those books. And then when I see, but it was huge, it was three meters and really like that, you know? And then I pulled them and I walked away and then I called the farmer because I was staying in a kind of a room in a farm. And then of course they went there and they killed the big, the, the big snake and they felt very proud of it, you know? Anyhow. Yeah. You punish, I'd say that before create, let's talk about tigers. Why, why they kill tigers in India so much tiger? <laughs> now let's talk, let's stop talking about all these jivas, you know, that they are disappearing from the planet. The Upanishads say that before creation, there was awareness, consciousness alone. And it thought, let me create the words. Then desiring, desiring to be many, it created the words by its will, lending existence and consciousness to them. The creation arose out of space from which air, fire, water, and earth, and then after other configurations, you know, such as vegetation, food, and many bodies subsequently evolved. The space evolved out of consciousness, of course. So what is interesting here is that we hear that sometimes, yeah? that uh, consciousness thought, okay, I'm bored, I'm too alone here, too lonely, let me create the words, I'm desired, diversity, desire to be man. And of course, 
this statement does not make much sense uh, because uh, consciousness, Brahman, is not moved by will or desire or karma. Uh, so it's just uh, Maya. Maya somehow brings about the superimposition called the universe. And then due to the proximity of consciousness, which is not so close, but it's all the way pervading everything. And then when the project is coming, and then everything starts dancing with the power of Brahman, consciousness. And then we say that Brahman is creating the world for some reason. So now the nature of Brahman, the nature of consciousness is make everything dance with aliveness with consciousness with existence you know sentient and inert beings they are there and they go through their process just because consciousness is all pervasive and maya brings this and then everything becomes you know alive <clears throat> but consciousness is not doing anything it's its nature the creation arose and so on. Our consciousness does not think or desire anything, although it's capable of thought and desire when Maya is operating. So who is desire, desiring, you know? So Maya is not really desiring. Ishwara is not subject to karma or desire either. So that the whole thing goes all the way down to jivas. So the, the, this creation is a projection for the jivas, due to jivas' desires for experience, for experiencing duality, you know, it's just Maya pulls the power of jivas, jivatimas, more specifically, you know, Maya Shwara, and then the world keeps coming and going due to jivas' desires. So the whole thing goes to jivas' desires, and Maya is blamed because Maya is the one who somehow make the game too hard and difficult for the jiva the human jivas, it's very difficult stopping desiring the object, the, the, this, this energy of, of attraction and aversions towards these different configurations produced by my Shwara is something built into the system. Uh, and, uh, and it's so powerful, this force of vasanas, uh, of likes and dislikes, <coughs> that, uh, that we say that Maya, uh, through Rajas and most specifically Thomas pro, pro, <coughs> creates this condition called a, a vidya. And then the and then the Jiva Achima is caught up in ignorance and it's not capable of coming out without the help of the scriptures, of course. So the desire uh, is uh, goes into the account of all jivas, because as I said, Ishwara is not subject to desire, much less Brahman or, or consciousness. So who has brought about this universe? Okay, and then if we want to have an answer to that, we will say, oh, you know, it's a long story, but to make it short, as the jivas, we project, we create this universe for as long as we, you know, we find it to be real, yeah? and we have desire for it, desire for duality. And then Ishwara is going to keep it for us. When Maya is operating, Maya or, or consciousness, you know, Maya or Ishwara assumes the power of creator, creation, maintenance, and the solution. So Ishwara comes into place, and then Ishwara projects Jivas and Jagata. Creation is only possible if Maya apparently objectifies consciousness. Since consciousness is not actually objectifiable, is space, time, and causality on their birth to this apparent object fish. Okay, so it was made a bit complicated, this phrase. So creation is only possible due to Maya in association with Ishwara, the real intelligence that projects and sustains and destroys, you know? And then it, it brings about something as the universe, okay? 
And then uh, what happens is that awareness or consciousness appears as the world. And then the jiva, from the point of view, the point of view of the jiva, consciousness, the universe appears, and then uh, we are totally crazed for it. And then there is this duality, the jiva and, and the creation, but the creation is nothing but Brahman. But the jiva atima does not know, the anyani does not know. So the universe is project, it does not know that its own nature, okay? It does not understand that there is a creator as well, which is pure knowledge, pure intelligence. And then, and then we, we have this appearant, uh, appearant reality, you know, which seems to be real, but it's not real. So as if Brahman became the world and can be seen by the Jiva Atma as the world, space, time, and causality on their birth to this appearant reality, this appearant universe, the appearant world, Mitya. So Mitya space, time, and the causality on their birth to this appearing projection, superimposition, and then the whole cycle of Vishwara, Jiva, Jagata, and the infinite souls comes come into to play here, to process, you know, their karmas, their vasanas, and so on. Many modern teachings only affirm the existence of consciousness and deny the existence of the world. But Vedanta provisionally accepts the reality of the world and the reality of the human experience. <clears throat> okay, we say that uh, it's apparently real, okay? And uh, we, we don't say that it does not exist, okay? Some people say that uh, Jiva and the universe do not exist. Huh? Only awareness or consciousness exists. You know, but uh, in Vedanta we say that uh, uh, although the universe exists, you know, although Jiva and Jagata and Ishwara exist, they exist within uh, a suborder of reality called Mitya. Okay, and then we explain this category of Mitya, something that exists, but as Namarupa, let's say, as a superimposition of names, colors, and forms, okay? But the essence of everything is pure gold, it's pure clay, and then infinite configurations can be made, but there is only one reality, which is the substantial nature of the universe as conscious existence. Yeah? So we don't say that does not exist, we say that exists, as Nietzsche, that which exists, but it's not really real, okay? <clears throat> and if we, if we deny existence, or if we deny a certain apparent reality to this universe, and then the game is over from the get-go, and then there is no possibility for the jiva to process its karma, its vasana. You know, people jump the gun and say, oh, nothing exists. So there is no teacher, no teaching, no jiva, no karma. There is nothing, okay? And then, and then there is no possibility for the jiva achima to, to grow. We experience the world, so there is a certain level of existence to this world because we experience, we cannot experience something that does not exist, okay? So the whole idea that I don't exist and the world does not exist is absurd because there's no such a thing as non-existence as we know, it does exist. And our perception and experience of this world is a proof of its existence. Okay? But uh, whether it's really real or, or not really real is the key, you know, and then you have to examine and you want to, you want to establish or, or, or base your life on, on reality to the best of your ability. So, and then don't rely on objects of Nietzsche, of Maya for your happiness and freedom, right? 
because they are not really real. You are the only reality. Definition of Jiva. Anything from you guys? I was thinking how beautifully this um, discussion fits in with what we were doing Thursday with Drik Drik Shivaveka, seeing of the experience, the five different aspects, you know, the Satchit Ananta and the Nama Rupa. Mm -hmm. And it's just, um, so this is just taking us um being that and the this discrimination it's showing us that there is a part of this mitya that is not a problem <laughs> just no problem we don't have to real so the understanding really has to be with the jiva doesn't it you have to really know yeah. what this thing you you think you are <laughs> actually is to discriminate it yeah. Well said. Yeah. <sighs> okay. Definition of Jiva. Jiva is consciousness with a subtle body. It is a principle, tattva, not a specific person. It's actually pure consciousness, Paramatma, Brahman, the one etern eternal Jivatima manifests as three entities, I would say, <clears throat> little Jivas, uh, three entities. Let me <clears throat> rephrase. So Jiva is consciousness, is consciousness reflected in a subtle body. It is a uh, universal principle, okay? It's a eternal principle within creation that is creator, creation, and creatures. The creatures are there, and intelligent creatures, you know, with uh, free will and, uh, and discrimination faculty. They appear here and there all over the universe from what we understand. Yeah? So this jiva is a principle, meaning to say consciousness is all pervasive. When the creation brings about subtle bodies, and then immediately you have sentience, okay? A sentience is refined when the subtle body is refined. By refinement, we mean this sense I am, and I know that I am, and I can interact with my field of experience and learn something, okay? So this is the jiva, yeah? It's consciousness shining in a subtle body. It is an eternal principle. It's not in a specific person. So this goes to the concept of the eternal jiva, okay? It's a principle. It is actually pure consciousness, jiva, atima, jiva, because jiva is not a subtle body. Subtle body is matter, jiva, is consciousness shining in a subtle body, reflecting a subtle body and produce the jiva, which is a principle. And it's, it is actually pure consciousness. Actually, it is paramatma, this jiva atma, okay? Now we are talking about jiva atma, reflected consciousness is ja atma jiva, <laughs> you know? The subtle body we can call the jiva, reflect consciousness is atma jiva, jiva atma. So the jiva atma, is actually consciousness or paramatma, but more often than not, it does not know that, you know, it does not know that it is limitless consciousness. The one eternal jivatima manifests as three entities, okay? So according to the state of experience, so we know the three states, and then according to our state of experience, there will be three different entities, okay? A Vishwa, the entity in the awakening state. In this state, its mind is totally extroverted and it is hypnotized by duality, it's fascinated by 
all nama rupas, you know, and it wants to touch, feel, hear, and see, and taste, and you know, it wants to consume, yeah, mitya, or, or the objects of samsara. So this is the visual extrovert, this five senses in the mind look out and then immediately wants to have an experience with the object. It chases and consumes experiences. Mm. It chases and consumes experience. So we are consumers. Yeah? So it's very interesting, yeah, because uh, uh, when I lived in the United States, uh, I understood that, oh my God, the government sees us as consumers and they, it's sometimes they even put it out, you know, consumers, consumer, taxpayers, you know? oh, and we are taxpayers, we are, we are nothing but taxpayers or consumers, because we want to consume, yeah? we want to consume, we chase and consume experience, because we are fascinated by duality. Vishwa may be a uh, Jiva Mukta. So Jiva Mukta is a uh, Vishwa, yeah? free, free from identification with objects. Vishwa may be a Vishwa Mukta, uh, uh, Jiva Mukta, free identification with object or sansa. So Vishwa can be a Yani or Anyani. When it is anyani, ayani, it's uh, it does it's free from the ignorance that makes them uh, totally uh, hypnotized by the objects, obsessed by the objects. Okay, so Vishwa, when it when it's ayani, it's free from the ignorance that compels them to be consuming. You know, objects, you know, are totally fascinated and running for, running for, running from. But, you know, this magnet force of attraction and repulsion and, and the person is caught up in this ram, ram, ram of the rat race, as we say in the USA. <clears throat> so it can be a Jiva Mukta, but Jiva Mukta is not doing that. It's uh, it somehow it develops a certain balance and uh, it's understand understand that the world is just uh, on a projection and uh, essentially intrinsically it does not, it's not real and it's not going to to fulfill any jivatima because the very nature of jivatima is puna is fulfillment. Yeah? So the sansara is a different thing. The visual when it is a samsari or anyani, it's totally identified as the body mind and it's identified with a doer and enjoyer, the ego. Yeah? And, uh, and he believes to be the, the, the thinker uh, of the thoughts and the doer of the actions and he does actions to enjoy the resultat. So he's chasing objects all the time. Both the Jiva Mukta, a liberated person, and the samsari, a bound person, both have a common identity as consciousness. So what is the big deal? If you're already consciousness, who cares about becoming a Jiva Mukta? No? Because I am already consciousness. It's my, my identity is consciousness and it's free, you know? And it's not limited or affected by any of my experience. So, and then uh, why I want to, to chase, you know, why I want to, to become a seeker? Because I want to be liberated from this ignorance that compels me to suffer samsara. Now that's, the, the jiva is already free, but not knowing it, it somehow, it has a hard time. And then uh, it's going to go for the scriptures, not because he's going to gain consciousness or, or gain a new identity, just to remove the, the <clears throat> obstacles no? that are preventing him to accept and enjoy its identity in consciousness as consciousness. Usually the word jiva refers to the awakening state entity. No? Although here and there, for some reason, we often find Upranya Jiva, no? 
you, we don't hear much the, the Taijaza Jiva, but Pranya Jiva, we hear because the beginning of the creation, when the Jivas are created, they are created as Pranya, you know, pure uh, seeds of, of this eternal principle. Huh? The Jiva is created there as Pranya. So we call Pranya eternal Jiva. But uh, <clears throat> the Taijaza is another story. You know? And uh, but the visual is the is the big thing for us because only in the awakened state we can learn and we can gain maturity and, uh, and understand our true nature. Right? Yes, as a, a deep sleeper, there is no chance, and as a dreamer, I mean, again, you know, there is very little we can learn in the dream state because uh, our intellectual faculty there is really lousy, you know? We, we, we don't have much power to discriminate except some dreams that are very interesting that you may discriminate the dream as a dream, not as the waking state reality, <clears throat> apparent reality, of course. Okay, how about the Taijaza, the China one? So the Chai Jaza, the shiny one, why it's said to be shiny world, a shiny one, because of a shiny world. <laughs> why it's said to be the shiny one, you know, because Vishwa is also shiny. Huh? So Vishwa is the Jiva, which is consciousness shining, or, or, or the subtle body shining. You know? But the subtle body of the Vishwa, when it shines, it shines turn to the world, it is extrovert, okay? It immediately sees the world through the five sense organs and the mind, and it's a shiny extrovert one. And then the Taijaza, we say the shining one because it is introverted, okay? It, it shines, but it, its light does not illumine the world, it's light, the light that shines with the state of the jiva, in the deep sleep, the light that shines is going to not illumine the world, but illumine its vasanas. It, it brings alive one's vasanas. So it's very interesting. It shines the causal body, it sheds light into the unconscious mind, and then this dream state come into play. <clears throat> Therefore, it said the shining one, okay? Shining, it's, it's, it's basement, let's say. It illumines itself, producing the dream state. In the dream state, the subtle body is turned inward, facing the causal body. The events appearing in the dream are just awakening state events that have become vasanas. So it's uh, the dream state, although they are most of the time, they are strange projections that uh, uh, distorted and vague and abstract. We can, we have to try to understand the meaning of that. Sometimes it's a little bit more clear, but the, the dream state is nothing but the awakening state recycled because the awakening state is a state by which we collect impressions. And these impressions, many of these impressions, they, they don't fade, you know, some of them they, they, they remain deposited in our subconscious mind, okay? In our causal body as impressions, mental, emotional impressions. And then in the night, this is going to shine, okay? It's just the awakening state experience that were retained as impressions that then they are recycled. And then we say, oh my God, where it came from? Because I don't think the this was rec recycled from experience of this lifetime. Because sometimes some dreams, some people say that may be uh, recycled from past incarnations. And that is also possible, I would say. Because our, our Vasana load is not limited to the impressions of this lifetime, but it's 
extends itself to many impressions from previous incarnations. The events appearing in the dream state are just recycled vasanas, or the same events of the awakened state, which out picture as dream events. In the awakened state, Jiva identifies with the body mind, with, with the physical body as the doer. So the doer is not seen as an object. So, so in the awakened state, the Jiva immediately identifies itself as, as the doer, the thinker of thoughts and the doer of action. So he has a hard time to objectify this instrument of knowledge experience because he becomes it. He becomes, it's, it's in the awakened state. It's, uh, I mean, everybody falls for that, you know? Uh, I can't see my, my, my body as an instrument of experience. I see my body as I, me, you know? So in the awakened state, that's the situation of the jiva. It's identified as the doer and the enjoyer, of course. In the dream state, there is a certain identification, but the doer may also appear as an object going about its dream life illumined, illumined by Taijaza. Awareness reflected uh, inwardly. Yeah? Uh, <clears throat> actually, awareness yeah, reflects on the subtle body, let's say. Or, or, yeah, we cannot say reflect in the causal body. It reflects in the subtle body and uh, illuminating the content of the causal body. So what is relevant here is that we probably all had that experience or read. Sometimes we are, we are dreaming and uh, we, we are not totally identified as the guy there in the dream because we see the dream and say, oh my God, there I am. I'm a, now I'm a real trouble now, huh? look. I have to run here, you know, and then you see yourself going about the dreamer. Huh? So there is a certain objectivity towards the the dream, the dreamer entity. Okay, so the Taijaza is dreaming. Yeah, sorry, I made a confusion. Taijaza with Prana before saying that Taijaza was illumined the causal body. You know, Taijaza is just it's just there. No, it's illumining the, the subtle body, shining the content of the causal body. Okay. So uh, what, what's relevant is that I find it's interesting that uh, it's so hard for us to objectify our jiva in the awakened state and somehow it naturally often happens in the dream state. Yeah? And uh, we, we don't we don't extract much self-knowledge, meaning to say, I'm not the experienced entity, I'm something watching, you know, because we don't pay attention, we do not pay attention to dreams, you know, we, 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 we discard it unreal as if it was much, much more unreal than the awakening state uh, experience that we have as well. Now let's look into the prana, the, the deep sleeper. In deep sleep state, prana is a subtle bridge that makes experience possible and means almost enlightened. Hmm. Interesting. So now prana is being presented as the very, very subtle modification or subtle thought or bridge. Okay. There is a sense of I there in the prana, which is very subtle. You know? And uh, it's so subtle that it's not really conscious. We are not very conscious of that. I experience nothing in the deep sleep. You know? But this, it is this subtle bridge, this subtle I, you know? that makes experience possible. And uh, it's said to be someone the entity is almost enlightened. And uh, it's almost enlightened because it experienced the limitless and bliss of consciousness. Uh, so in other words, we experience non-duality because uh, in the deep sleep, 
there is no a duality, subject, ex conscious or, or, or tangible uh, uh, experiencer and object of experience and an experience taking place. That is erased, you know, due to too many, too much Thomas in the equation of this vritch, this subtle vritch, this subtle reflection that is the, the, <coughs> the prania. Yeah? So it is almost enlightened, why? <clears throat> because <clears throat> it's blissful. No duality means ananta, bliss, no peace, no problems. That's why we enjoy a good night of deep sleep. Yeah? And, uh, and then we say, oh my God, I feel so good when I sleep. So I'm almost enlightened because uh, all my problems are resolved and I feel limitless. You know, my ignorance is removed. All my concerns are removed. And I disappear. My evil disappears. My evil is a problem. My thoughts disappear. So I'm in a state of uh, liberation, right? But what is the problem with the liberation of deep sleep? Is that it fades with the next entity once the deep sleeper turns to become a dreamer or a waker. Huh? And then it does not help much that freedom, okay? When we say that it's almost enlightened, it means it's almost liberated because it's liberated only temporarily. And unfortunately, we don't have our intellect at our disposal, uh, uh, disposed in that condition, in that uh, experience to learn something. No, no, it's not present in deep sleep, the intellect. In deep sleep, Jiva's subtle body and its personal causal body, which stores its vasanas and produces its karma, is subsumed into Ishwara. So this is a very nice concept. So when we are in deep sleep, you know, we are merging into the macrocosm causal body of Ishwara as the eternal prana, okay? The beginning of this entity, this principle. Uh, called Jiva, you know, eternal principle called Jiva. So it is merged, it is subsumed into Ishwara, the macrocosm calls the body. So <clears throat> in deep sleep, the subtle body in its personal calls the body, which is stores, which stores its vasanas and produces its calm, is subsumed into Ishwara. The macrocosm calls the body, the deep sleep state. Deep sleep is the presence of pure tamas. Rajas and sattva are suppressed in it. There is no sense of duality of the ego, ahamkara, in this state, because the subtle body, the residence of the ego, is again suppressed by excess of tamoguna. Okay? So this is a very subtle. When we come, when we enter the causal body and we begin talking about the experience of the prana in deep sleep, okay, we are really entering deeper waters of Vedanta. I love these explorations and I will be happy to, to, to do that with you guys next week because uh, we could, have a good time doing so. Okie dokie. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purna Purnamuda Chate Purna Sya Purnamadaya Purname Bhavashishate Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, my good friends. Today we are on a G3 mode. Let's hope that we don't go below the G3. <laughs> and G3, G2, and then G1, and then there are no class. <laughs> okay, dog. See you next week. Namaste. Thanks, Alinda. Thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye, Pilen. Bye. 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 Bye.